are at the new entrance to the college and this is, has been built with the stones that used to be in the old former back gate. Each stone was numbered and brought over here and placed in exactly the same position that it was in uh, on the old gate. Quite a business but I think it's made a very nice entrance to the new entrance to the college, very attractive with the mountain behind and the games fields and I think it's good. This building, which is now a house, was originally built as a sanatorium. At the beginning of the war, the building was required for, as, a, as a house for the increased number of, of boys in the school, many of whom had come from English schools. So the sanatorium was moved over into the wood, into the house now known as Deer Park House. And this building became Stack Allen and subsequently Grange. This building was constructed in the most unusual way. Two layers of sacking suspended from a frame were sort of buttered with a concrete slurry. However, it seems to have worn pretty well over the past 65 years. In this summer term of 1943, a friend of mine and I, Tom Haskins his name was, crept out in the middle of the night about two o'clock in the morning, it was quite light, and the two of us managed to put up over the front door a huge piece of plywood that Tom had adorned with the words Pedant's Palace, the Pedant being the name that we had for the housemaster of this building, uh, George White. and. Um, <laughs> We got a stool from the Founders Building and climbed up on it and we put this enormous thing and the next morning the school was delighted to see this huge sign saying Pedant's Palace. And here's an example of the type of stone that was used in the Argyle building and the dining hall. And over there, there's a splendid example of the kind of granite that was available for the work that needed to be done. Looking at Deer Park House brings back so many memories. From behind this window, I heard a German bomb go off in Amien Street. It was around here that I learned to ride a bike. This is the remains of an old gravel pit into which was chucked all the coke that came from the college gas plant in the days before there was electricity. And during the war, or just after the war, I should say, uh, when the, uh, it was very cold and there was very 
an acute shortage of fuel, some old man who had worked in the gas plant said that there was a whole lot of coke up here. So they brought him up, an old man, and he put a kick around with his foot like this. And lo and behold, up, up came a, a chunk of, of uh, coke. Now I'm going to have a try it. See if we can find anything here. I think probably we won't. We won't. Right, George. Here we are. <laughs> well, this is a, one of the of the coke mine that was mined by the boys during the uh, win um, winter term of 1947, when the snow lay so deep that games couldn't be played, and the school was turned out to to mine this pit, and tons and tons of this coke were removed and used in the boiler. And that kept the school going for a few months. There it is. That's what kept us going. Sylvia was absolutely death on Buchelon Bui and used to go up, walk around the place with a special little shovel on the end of his walking stick digging out Buchelon Bui wherever he could. He learnt the, he learnt the name, it was the only Irish phrase he knew. He learnt it from Eamon de Valera who many years later they met again somewhere and Dev said to my father, do you remember the Irish that I taught you? What's the Irish for ragweed? My father said, Buchalon Bui. <laughs> In those days, Buchalon Bui was uh, sort of an embargoed weed. You, you, there were signs all over the place saying that you must dig it up. It was virtually a crime to have it found on your property. Don't seem to worry too much about it now. That's the remains of the old swimming pool and the diving board was at that end of the, of the, the pool. It was quite a small pool as you can see. There's an amusing story about my father on his first day was brought up here to see the swimming pool and he found the diving board with the following inscription painted on it, not to be used until tomorrow. The bursar, who was also English, said to my father, Welcome to Ireland, Warden. <laughs> this is the remains of a door that was cut into the wall during Warden Sobey's time to enable Eamon de Valera, then president, to go out onto Kilmashogue to have a look at a Civil War monument to a person who was killed just outside the wall here. I don't know when it was locked up again. This is where the stream from Kilmashogue entered the college grounds. For years the stream was the, the sole supply of water for the entire college and was a constant source of worry when it dried up, as it is now. Uh, and until the supply was discovered down at the bottom of the college near the cricket field, uh, the, the, the matter of water supply was constantly on the agenda of the fellows' meetings.
This is the location of a hut I once had. Uh, there was a great craze in the college at one time. The boys had huts all over the grounds, a sort of smoking parlours. A friend of, my, of mine and I used to climb over the wall. Outside there was a potato patch and we'd pinch potatoes and bring them in, cut them up and fry them, making the most delicious chips. It was a great place. <laughs> no, no sign of it now. All gone. After the stream came through the wall, it, the water passed down a series of uh, settling tanks, uh, about ten of them in, in steps. There was gravel at the bottom to act as a sort of preliminary filter. This was a, a, a large settling tank, about six or eight feet deep. The water passed from the settling uh, channel into this tank and from there it was siphoned off into um, filter beds where, which were underground and they've been covered over now by the golf course. There were quite a lot of trout in here and I used to take the caddis worms which I ripped out of their nice little tubes and throw them in and watch the, watch the trout come to the surface and swallow them. I tried catching them, in fact I did catch a few, I always put them back but I figured that if there were small trout there, there must also be parent trout. And I tried and tried and tried and so did a, a number of people to see if we could catch the large ones, but we never did. And then, lo and behold, some few years back, when this tank was cleared out, apparently at the bottom of the tank, in, in amongst the mud, there was found a large trout, about a pound weight, flapping in the mud. That was my old friend from 40 years back. <laughs> well, we're now on the old back drive. Here is where the, the back gate used to be. And it was the stones from the back gate that were used in the, in the new gate that we saw earlier on. Well, here we are again at the same spot that we were in three years ago when we videoed before the motorway was started. So let's go down and have a look and see how the present situation compares with what we had uh, three or four years ago. Come with me. These houses, of course, are new since we were here last. They've gone up very quickly. Don't like them very much. Ah, I'm glad to see that the stone which was out here in the middle of the field is still there. It hasn't suffered from the rebuilding going on.
Well, here's the remains of College Road and the new College Road, which is a much better version of it than the previous one. And down there, where those um, cones are, is where we used to go into into Mali for, for games. All the games, cricket and uh, rugby and hockey and everything, were played down there at one time, uh, with the exception of cricket on the on the first eleven pitch. And there was a gate in the wall there. We went in there. And um, if you look back here, that's the edge of the the first eleven cricket field up there. And you can see how close it is to the new motorway. And somebody who can really hit sixes could hit a ball right out onto the motorway with, I would think, disastrous results. So I suspect that first senior cricket will not be played there anymore. It would be too dangerous for the traffic.